Today on Investigate TV, university hazing that ends with 911 calls, police reports, and death. You see his chest rising at all? She said, does you see his chest rising? I hope you rising, guys. Plus, underage gamblers, college and high school students placing bets, racking up huge debts. It's kind of a knife in the chest because it was tough to lose that much money. Investigate TV starts right now. Hello and welcome to Investigate TV. I'm Lee Zurich. Assault, humiliation, forced alcohol consumption, dangerous initiations disguised as harmless traditions. According to StopHazing.com, more than 50% of college students involved in clubs, groups, and teams experience hazing. Josie Sturman dug through records from some of the nation's biggest universities. We warn you, some of what you're about to see and hear is disturbing. County 911. What is your emergency? Hi, um, someone that we know is uh, non responsive. He drink alcohol, like a lot of alcohol. It's just before midnight, March 4th, 2021, at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. You see his chest rising up and down? No, not right now. Okay, and he's blue? Yeah. Okay, then he, there's a good chance he's not breathing. The one's vibrant sophomore, Stone Foltz, is on the floor of his apartment, purple and unresponsive. Just an hour before, he'd been at Pi Kappa Alpha, attending an initiation event, where police say he downed an entire bottle of bourbon in 23 minutes. You see his chest rising at all? She said, does you see his chest rising? I hope you rising, guys. A dispatcher counts through Three, compressions. Four, higher five, and higher they go, six, every number seven, a prayer. Eight, and when they're done, the critical question. You do see it going up and down? Do you see his chest? Oh my God, oh my God. Is it rising or not? Oh my God, no, no, no. Put someone else on the phone. Put someone else on the phone right now that will help him. But help for the 20 year old business student, athlete and big brother is too late. Doctors cannot save Stone Foltz who died three days later from fatal alcohol intoxication. His death, one of at least 50 in the last 22 years, linked to hazing. It's a blow to the chest uh, and you, you never get used to it. Hank Neuer knows more about hazing incidents than most. He's written five books about the topic and maintains what many consider the most comprehensive database of hazing deaths in the country. For example, this one's a death, Chico State University. Neuer's research shows that between 1959 and 2022, hazing has humiliated countless students, with at least one of them severely injured or killed every single year. Why do you think people hold so tightly to these rituals or traditions that essentially put everybody at risk? They bond. Hazing, unfortunately, does bond people together, and it gives them a quote-unquote family. Students make friends for life. That has been part of the problem with alumni fighting to keep what they call traditions, and I call dangerous stunts. Some call it criminal, but our months-long investigation found that depends on where you live. Our national investigative team analyzed state hazing laws nationwide. We found a patchwork of regulation that's done little to stop these disturbing and sometimes deadly rites of passage. Six states currently have no anti-hazing laws on the books at all. In 22 states across the U.S., schools don't have to write or post policies against the practice. And only 10 require colleges and universities, including private schools, to publicly report hazing cases. There's so much more information that you need to make an educated decision. I love that one, though. Yeah. Evelyn and Jim Piazza got an education in hazing the worst way possible. It cost them their youngest son, Tim. The 19-year-old was on his very first night of pledging Beta Theta Pi at Penn State University in February 2017, when a lawsuit filed by his family claims he went through a legendary hazing event, the alcohol-fueled obstacle course known as the gauntlet. 
After surviving the drinking contest behind these doors, Tim, who was heavily intoxicated, fell down the stairs and was knocked unconscious. He was dumped on a couch in the basement and largely ignored for hours, with no call to 911, even though his family says Tim struggled overnight, falling again. It took us 19 years to raise an incredible, amazing individual, and it took 12 hours for people to destroy that. The Piazzas have spent the last five years fighting to make sure Tim's life wasn't lost in vain. They all think they're invincible and that nothing bad's going to happen, but it can happen in in a split second. You cannot predict what's going to happen with hazing. But tragedies have continued to span the nation. Our national investigative team spent months digging into the hazing that's continued since Tim's death, filing information requests for hazing reports from the 46 largest public and private universities required by law to make them public. We ultimately found or obtained records from 35 schools, uncovering 342 punishable hazing incidents dating back to 2017. The reports we obtained show fraternities are tied to most of the cases, more than 75% of all the incidents. But trends are hard to analyze given almost half the case reports we obtained didn't include specific details. Still, our team found alcohol was a major factor, cited in more than 120 hazing incidents. 119 cases involved physical abuse, including sleep deprivation, punishments involving food, and strenuous exercise. And 11 hazing reports detailed students placed in compromising or sexually charged situations. Where does it end? What happens in the next 10 years if we don't stop it? Yet despite new tragedies every year, hazing continues. In October 2021, video obtained by our national investigative team shows one of the most shocking hazing cases captured on camera. It features Danny Santulli, a 19-year-old freshman at the University of Missouri. He's in the green blindfold, being herded down the stairs at Phi Gamma Delta fraternity. He's given an entire bottle of vodka to finish, even as brothers funnel beer down his throat. This is Danny Santulli now. A lawsuit filed by his family says alcohol poisoning left him with brain damage, unable to walk, talk, or see. It's something you can't imagine. It was unimaginable for Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy until the death of Max Groover at his alma mater, Louisiana State University, in 2017. After that, he introduced the End All Hazing Act. The bill would require colleges and universities nationwide to post hazing incidents on their websites. What would you say to the colleges and universities who are unwilling to provide this information and in some cases have to be forced to tell the public what happens? I would say that that points to the need of our legislation. There's always going to be an attorney that's going to screen that letter of request and says this opens us up to liability or to bad publicity, uh, etc. Now, if it's a federal law, it becomes less easy to hide that. Through dozens of records we obtained, we discovered only about a third of the organizations involved in the incidents we examined were suspended by their universities, and just 11 groups were banned from campus. The decisions permanently breaking those ties that supposedly bind during hazing and leave heartbreak in its wake. The girls need to go in another room. Hey, go to another, go in another room, go to another room. With friends and family on the other end of the phone line, as their loved ones become statistics and headline stories. Max, Tim, Danny, Stone. Names that live on when lives are lost to hazing. The fraternities involved in the cases highlighted all condemn the actions that led to injuries and deaths. They have all taken steps to change the culture of their organizations. They've also implemented health and safety initiatives designed to eliminate hazing. You can read their statements and learn more about these cases on our website, investigatetv.com. Coming up, we speak to a grieving family partnering with the university where their son died. Their mission, overhaul the pledging process and prevent future tragedies. No other family needs to, to go through this. No other young adult needs to go through this. That's our mission.
Welcome back to Investigate TV. Young people deceived, abused, threatened. Hazing that takes lives and injures hundreds each year. And we uncover the punishments that follow do little to curb the problem. Josie Sturman spoke with two parents who lost their son to hazing. They shared their fight to change the pledging system. Great big brother. Very, very supportive. Photographs and mementos are not the only things keeping Stonefoltz's memory alive nearly two years after his death. Instead, a decision he made at just 16 years old to become an organ donor means his heart still beats on, his lungs still breathe, and critical pieces of his eyes still view the world that continues spinning without him in it. So the best thing we can do is continue to spread Stone's story and help others. Stone's story is a tragedy for his parents, Corey and Sherry, and a striking example of what some consider a national epidemic that's killed at least 60 students in the last 23 years, hazing on college campuses. The grooming sucks them in, it brainwashes them um, into thinking that it's okay, everyone had to go through this. Stone didn't get through it. The 20 year old died in March 2021 after a hazing incident at Pi Kappa Alpha at Bowling Green State University. No other family needs to, to go through this. No other young adult needs to go through this. That's our mission. A mission to end hazing now strengthened by an unlikely source, the university that once denied any responsibility for Stone's death. This is a historic day. In January, the family reached a record-setting settlement with Bowling Green. Much of the university's nearly $3 million payout to the Foltzes will go to a foundation named for Stone, focused on a shared mission to eradicate hazing across the nation. We think the pledge process needs a drastic change. And the Foltz's attorney, Rex Elliott, is calling for pledging to be eliminated altogether. If we eliminate that imbalance of power, I think we have a much better chance of eliminating hazing deaths in this country. Yet despite deaths and injuries, there's been no significant shift away from the unequal power dynamic of the pledging process. Our national investigative team found that pledging was stopped temporarily, shortened or moved on campus following just 13 of the 265 punishable fraternity hazing incidents we examined. None resulted in outright pledging bans. The North American Interfraternity Conference, a trade group representing the nation's biggest fraternities, wouldn't talk on camera, but told us that for decades, fraternities have spent enormous resources educating students about the dangers of hazing, how to intervene and prevent it, and how to support victims. More has to be done. We need leadership on university campuses to step up and do a whole lot more than they've done up to now. It gives them the opportunity to show these other universities that, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna take charge. It's nowhere where it needs to be yet, but it's a step forward. It's definitely a step forward. A step the Foltz's hope will lead toward ending the rituals that rob them of the sun they see now only in pictures. Their new mission, yet another donation, turning Stone's loss into a way to save lives. Our team is aware of only one major fraternity, Sigma Alpha Epsilon, which has stopped pledging across the board. But even that hasn't ended hazing, with confirmed cases at several SAE chapters since their decision back in 2014. The organization declined an interview request. Up next, underage gamblers gaming the system, betting with money they don't have. So yeah, we went from going up $1,000 the first week we ended up going down double that amount, and then I had to, we had to fork it over. We investigate how they're being targeted after the break. Welcome back to Investigate TV. Sports betting, now legal in more than 30 states and Washington, D.C. In a Pew poll last year, about one in five adults said they'd bet money on sports in the last 12 months. But it's not just adults. Underage gamblers are betting and losing big. Josie Sturman shows us how underground betting sites are targeting students. From Selection Sunday to opening day. Let's go Cardinals! Whether you're watching athletes on ice or running routes, there's no doubt Americans are invested in sports. 
But for many, the game is just a little sweeter when there's money on the line. A recent study from the American Gaming Association says last year, U.S. fans legally bet more than $85 billion on sports. That's enough money to buy all 30 Major League Baseball franchises with cash left over. But that's not where it ends. The AGA estimates Americans spent another $63 billion on a big gamble, illegal sports betting. I think that the illegal market is a concern for all of us. It's a major concern for AGA's president and CEO, Bill Miller, because much of that money goes to unregulated sports books and offshore betting websites that offer none of the protections of legal sports gambling that's allowed in 36 states and D.C. The offshore illegal uh, websites don't care about age. They don't care about financial means. And so it's it's more than frustrating. It can be dangerous, especially because, as we've discovered, some of those taking their chances are underage kids finding a way to gamble underground using offshore websites. Investigate TV and our partners at the Arnold Center for Investigative Journalism at Indiana University spent months digging into the problem that puts young people well below the legal gambling age at risk. We discovered high school and college students using sports books with questionable odds from offshore sites based in places like Antigua and Europe. Their web addresses end in AG or EU. Some we found specifically target their schools. Bets are placed through a network where students, friends and acquaintances serve as the bookies and agents who recruit underage bettors and then handle the wagers and payments. Silent backers often pay subscriptions for the offshore sites and hand out access codes when they're needed. They front the money to cover the book when people win and often allow bets on credit when they don't. Kids can win big, but they can also go bust. And when that happens, they can rack up debts bigger than a student loan payment. I didn't think of losing. That quickly changed for this Indiana student who asked us not to reveal his name out of concern for his future. He says he began sports betting as a sophomore in high school, didn't even have a driver's license, but was already laying down bets through an illegal book a friend brought him into. They bet together, but after their big payout was quickly lost, he says they were allowed to keep betting on credit. So yeah, we went from going up $1,000 the first week, we ended up going down double that amount. Kind of a knife in the chest because it was tough to lose that much money. This would be my free play balance if I were betting on the site. While he's now old enough to legally gamble, he showed us a few popular offshore sites used by many underage students at the university. They make all the effort that they can to appear to be legitimate, but it's hard to go after them. Dina Titus, the Democratic co-chair of the Congressional Gaming Caucus, wants the Department of Justice to have more tools in the fight against offshore sites. Now, it's not just my concern, but the industry itself is concerned. It's difficult to work this type of investigations because they are operating legally a lot of times in their own jurisdiction. Having said that, we've had some successes. Wins that have come through the FBI's Integrity in Sport and Gaming Initiative, which focuses in part on tackling sports gambling by going after illegal operators. Supervisory agent Beto Quiroga and analyst Aaron Leifer say the problem has been on the agency's radar since the days of the corner bookie working with pen and paper, long before legal betting took off nationwide. The introduction of legalized operators has certainly changed the scope of the threat, but in no way do we feel like we've been behind the threat or we're still catching up. Instead, they say the FBI is trying to get ahead by educating the public about the dangers associated with offshore sites, which the FBI says can end up funding things like drug trading and human trafficking. So we would be concerned about any individual, specifically someone underage, that may be getting involved and tied in with this type of thing. It's dangerous and it's concerning. No one knows that better than the Indiana student who showed us how kids who can't legally bet are able to game the system through offshore sites. He says he'll place a casual legal bet occasionally, but now prefers the emotional roller coaster of simply watching sports to betting on them. It's worth noting the AGA's recent research shows illegal sports betting has a huge impact across the country with as much as 700 million in lost tax revenue that's typically used to fund state programs. Want to hear more stories like this? Check out the Investigate TV YouTube page for our latest content and partnerships. Coming up as high school seniors plan their first year of college, there also comes the search for loans and grants to ease high costs. 
Hear how that makes students vulnerable to scammers after the break. Welcome back to Investigate TV. College costs are skyrocketing over the last two decades. According to U.S. News & World Report, tuition and fees at private universities have jumped more than 130 percent. The spike is even steeper at public universities. Rising freshmen are looking for ways to ease the financial burden, but that can make them susceptible to scams. Carice Jackman explains. Whether they're applying for scholarships, searching for grants, or trying to get a loan, the quest for financial aid is critical for many high school seniors preparing to head off to college. But experts say those looking for help footing the bill need to beware. Their personal information is a top target for con artists. One of the biggest things people forget is your 18-ish, 17, 18, 19-year-old student a lot of times has a really good, clean credit record, and unfortunately, that's what scammers are after. Melanie McGovern with the Better Business Bureau says scammers use a variety of methods to lure students, from an email pretending to be from a prospective school to posing as a guidance counselor. When in doubt, give the office a call and say, hey, did you send me this email? Uh, you know, and they'll let you know either way. But it's really important to know where it's coming from before you put any kind of personal information into any kind of portal. One parent shared their experience with the BBB, saying the fraudster emailed their student, asking her if she needed assistance with paying for college. The student filled out a form with their contact information, and shortly after, the scammer asked for a payment of $2,000 in order to provide assistance with scholarships. You know, and a lot of times you don't have to do that. There are so many free resources for students to apply for scholarships all over the country. The FTC also shared ways to spot the scams. If someone tells you that a scholarship is guaranteed or your money back, if someone says you just need to give your credit card or bank account number to hold on to a scholarship, or if they say you're a finalist for a contest you didn't enter, all of those are signs of potential scams. If you still have doubts, McGovern says, don't be afraid to ask questions. Legitimate companies will always answer them and always give you the time. Uh, you know, if somebody's giving you a lot of pressure, you have to act now, you have to act now. Those are always the big red flag to walk away. With this Watching Your Wallet, I'm Carice Jackman. And that's it for us. Thanks for joining us here on Investigate TV. Hope to see you next week.